I think it's time to start. So welcome everyone. Today we have Marcin Podzie, who finished his PhD at the Aguilar University in 2014. Then he moved as a postdoc to Eindhoven, then to the neighboring Institute of Physics of the Polish Academy of Sciences, when he was changing group uh, uh, from, or for some time he was working uh, with Tomek Sowinski, many of you uh, knows him, and then he was working in MACTO, this international research agenda, which is run by Professor Dito. And then he moved to Barcelona, to ICFO, where he is because of a uh, NAVA program backer. And he went to Poland for uh, Eastern and had opportunity to hack him here and here today about the generation of many body entangled states in the analog and digital quantum simulators. So mm -hmm. marching the floor and screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to yeah. see the uh, place known to me and many uh, friends of the audience. And yeah, so the talk uh, will be quite broad. I will try to share the light on the some current efforts uh, towards uh, quantum technologies, broadly speaking. And we will narrow at some moment to more detailed uh, uh, focus of our work about generating kind of other uh, entangled quantum states in nowadays experiments with unfaculty atoms. At the beginning, let me uh, acknowledge my collaborators. So, all starts with Lydia Vitkowska and her group here uh, at Eastbound. And also with Mario Gaida, now I'm in Maciek's uh, Levenstein group in Ipo Barcelona. Uh, also, Gadimina Sigzelina from Venus University, Tanasu uh, from Emilia's group, Jan Fedenczuk, also Alice Sinatra, and Gedrus Lamps. So, there's like quite a lot of collaboration of different aspects, different topics, but there is a common effort. So, let me start from the big picture. So, today we in the community, people say that we are in the second quantum revolution. What does it mean? It means that uh, quantum mechanics, its properties, can be utilized for some particular uh, tasks, which can be used not only for the purely academic uh, problems, but for application problems for the society, broadly speaking. One can ask, what is the first quantum revolution? Of course, first quantum revolution is the appearing quantum mechanics in the in the in the history of developing the physics theories. So it starts at the beginning of the 20th century. And let's say 100 years later, after the first quantum revolution, we entered the time of the second quantum revolution. And second quantum revolution is about quantum technologies. And it's commonly said that quantum technologies are supported by four main pillars which is quantum simulation, quantum computing, quantum metrology, and quantum communication. And the research in the field of quantum technologies is basically intersection of few big uh, areas. So this is like the business of the quantum body systems, quantum information theory, open quantum systems, and it's the quantum computing theory, numerical methods for simulating system of the classical uh, computers to benchmark our future quantum computers. And of course, last but not least, all experimental efforts to apply all those areas in the real experiments. This is of course, uh, AMO physics, so atomic molecular and optical physics, as well as solid state systems, which have also uh, enormous control over many, many, let's say quantum hardware uh, implementations. But all those, all those things, they have one common aspect, that all are about massively entangled many body quantum states. This is the fundament on which all those PLs stand. So what we have to do, broadly speaking in the, in the technology and in the theory, we should be able to generate many other entangled states. We should be able to store them for the longer time or desired time in the experiments. We should be able to manipulate those states. Also, we should be able to validate entanglement. 
and send that someone send us the quantum state, and you should be able to check how much the entanglement is in in it. And it means also that you should be able to detect many other entanglements to have experimental protocols which allows us to say, okay, in this particular system, in this particular realization, under this condition, we have this number of the entangled states, no more, no less, so to speak. So having said that, let me shortly outline the presentation. So first I will just start from the very basic uh, of what we understand by Benimat entanglement and their correlation states, which are the fundamental of the quantum technologies. And next I will, I will tell you about uh, one way of generating set of states in the experiments, uh, how we can detect those entanglement and how we can use such a states. Uh, I will shortly introduce the experimental platforms which can be used for this particular task of generating such a state. And at the end, we will shortly mention about other way looking for generating states, not in the physical experiments in the sense of digital quantum simulators, but on the quantum circuits, which are called as the, sorry, here are analog quantum simulators, and those ones are digital quantum simulators, where we can directly program quantum computer to generate given state. So let's start with uh, the correlations. In the very down to earth uh, approach we, we are using. So let's consider n particles on uh, which we can prepare measurements with two outcomes. Two measurements with two outcomes. And let us introduce the correlator, which is the product of all outcomes averaged over many realizations. Okay? And if the above correlator, the value of this uh, correlator for the particular uh, setup can be obtained, can be reproduced with the form of this integral, where P is the probability distribution of appearing uh, given output of the, of the measurement, we say that those outcomes are consistent with the local hidden variable theory. Mm -hmm. And this means that basically this is in the classical region. However, uh, okay, so one more thing, uh, when we uh, make the modulus square of CN with the simple uh, mathematics using coffee host inequality, we can show that the modulus square of this correlator is bounded from above by two to minus n, when n is, n is the number of particles. And when you have the experiment, for example, with thin half particles, qubits, uh, in which we see that this inequality is violated, it means that we have entanglement and the classical language of classical collation is not sufficient to describe the experiment. And having uh, said that, we can consider different scenarios with our correlator and see that the correlator can capture some particular scenarios which can happen in the given experiment. For example, we can see that uh, if we consider state which is the product state of the many qubits, the correlator is bounded from uh, above by this value. And violating this value means that the state we have uh, considered the row we, we, we get is not separable. We can build another uh, constructions, for example, we can consider that you have n minus two separable spins and only two spins entangle. And our correlators also give the bound. Yes. So, so the bound to, to uh, minus two n, yes. why it's different from the previous one of the Lagrangian variable models? Because it was two. No, so it's two to minus two n. Uh, okay, yeah, so why, why it's different? Uh, I think it should be the same, no? Because like every model you can realize with the product states, the separable states. You are right. So it's yeah. Uh, so it's it's doing typing the lapic form. Thanks. Uh and you can build 
more correlators. We can consider power as entanglement and see what is the limit value of the correlator. So having uh, this correlator as a tool, we can, in some sense, distinguish what kind of entanglement we have in the system. And also, we can have uh, information about probably speaking capital entanglement in the in the in the considered system. Um, and, sorry, yes. Can I ask, so uh, can you move back to the slide? Um, I, I wonder about okay, probably you're gonna present it in what follows, but I wonder about sampling complexity of this protocol. So you know, in practice, when you are measuring those those correlators, you you have to gather final statistics, you have statistical fluctuations, and then you know, like if the bound here is exponentially smaller, the system size, uh, you're gonna have part time. I imagine you're gonna have part time statistically. So, the distinguishing if you are really violating this or not. Yeah, yeah. So, there's a very valid question. And the problem of measurement is totally uh, not the different, but the most challenging in the whole story. And that's true. That this now this is only on the paper. You can write what you want, but in the experimental application, this is. One of the most challenging tasks, and I will mention this very, very, very much. Uh, so, what I want to say here that uh, this correlator is our tool we will use in the in the next slides to classify different states. So, the question uh, we can ask is, can we generate such a state in the nowadays experiment? Because this is not so so trivial to say, okay. You can measure different things, but how you get the state? And we have the answer for one particular experimental realization, which is called uh, spin squeezing protocols. And now let me shortly introduce what the spin squeezing is. So let me start from the thing quite known in the atomic physics, which is known as the Rowley spectroscopy. And this is an experimental protocol allowing to measure in the experiment energy uh, transition, energy uh, difference between two uh, states in the two level system. And how it is done uh, in the experiment is done as follows. We prepare all atoms in, let's say, uh, lower state. So all atoms are in the A state. And it can be depicted on the block sphere as the all atoms side. Uh, from the North Pole, and you can prepare coherent superposition of atoms up and down. So you put them on the equator, and we allow the system to evolve under its own dynamics. And after time t, we project the evolved state onto the z axis on the system. It means that we measure occupation number difference between atoms in the upper or in the Lower state. And when we repeat many times such an experiment for different times capital T, what we do basically, we measure expectation value over time of the SZ operator. And such a measurement is, of course, uh, it has, of course, some uh, bounds for the accuracy, which are given by, by uh, statistics and, and non-commutation non rules for the sigma z operators. And what we want to do, uh, we want to make this, this horizontal uh, error make smaller. So the sim simplest way is we want to make the narrow. And actually one question, of course, is uh, answer to the is coming from statistics, quantum statistics, also changing in time now. This average as Z is a different among maybe I'm not the different okay. So in details, you, you are right. I want to just the simplest procedure scenario, but this is not not cost, right? But the fact right. we want to have the smallest possible uh smallest possible error we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, and the protocol allowing uh, to acquire such a we call this squeezing. Uh, is given by some which is called spin squeezing protocol. Sorry. So we need 
uh, the evolution of the system to be the nonlinear. The results from paper of Pitagora from 1993 that they say that we can, in the cost of variance of one spin component, we can reduce the variance of the orthogonal spin component, which is of interest for us. And they show that there are two particular uh, models, one which, which is called one axis twisting, which is nonlinear in the sigma z as z uh, operator, or two axis counter twisting, which is the difference between sigma z square minus uh, sx square operators. And such a Hamiltonian uh, allows us to reduce the, the variance of measuring the uh, of, of the delta omega. So they allow, allows us to decrease, increase the accuracy of this measurement. The protocol itself looks as follows. We start with the systems uh, on the equator and we allow to evolve. And with the all uh, Hamiltonian, we can see the family of different states. So we start from uh, the coherent superposition, Nonlinearity can squeeze the state, meaning that the decreasing the variance in one direction, in this direction, they appear later on superposition of coherent states and at time pi half in some properly chosen units, we, we have noon state. So we have uh, maximally entangled state. This experiment, uh, simulator of the odd dynamics, was uh, firstly uh, prepared in the group of Robert Haller and Trotlein in 2020, when they considered two modes was a nitrogen condensate. And they were uh, really able to show that the spin squeezing dynamics is possible when you properly arrange the interaction in the system. However, this was without uh, lattice. It was in the so-called two-mode approximation. We assume that the collection of N atoms can be described by only two modes. And then the question about the nature of many body entangled states generated during the OAT procedure. And it takes back to 1993 when they showed that the states can be squeezed. Next, 2008, it was shown that they appeared superposition of the coherent states. Later, there was works, was made by Remick, about generation of body body correlations and about sick body correlation in the system. And we asked the question. If you can generate with OAT, uh, Spargo to maybe complement that uh, timeline um, before 2008 and 2014, there was also an older work of uh, Levenstein, Sirach, and me, where we considered uh, not well inequalities, but uh, two and three qubit entanglement that implements in the, in the many body, well, in the many spin system. And we got a sort of uh, criteria which described, like it was shown on the slide before, uh, two and three qubit entanglement at a sort of a thin advanced higher order full squeezing. I see. Okay. So thanks for this comment. For so you, before, I before, before squeezing, and then there was also a bit of work on um, on entanglement. I see. Okay. Sorry for the historical. Sorry for that. I will. I will. Uh, no. That. No. no. Sorry, just a historical comment that it was a uh, Okay, thanks for that. So the question we want to uh, ask, and we basically start the other part of the story, is if we can generate arbitrary depth entanglement with the odd procedure, and if we can generate such a state in the optical lattice, which are under very much control experimental, so to say. And the question is if we can store type of time, the uh, type of state for the longer time, which is also a very uh, important aspect because all those states are generated dynamically in time. So we should be able to generate such a state and stop it and store it for, the, for our purpose. Uh, so now let me shortly uh, introduce our main results uh, where we use our correlator to analyze. The correlations generated during art in the um, bar of uh, n bosonic qubits. So, this is two more approximation. 
and the main results are presented here. So on the horizontal axis, we have time in the dynamics of the process. And on the vertical axis, we have value of how many correlated. And the, the black line corresponds to, let's say, simple uh, numeric numeric approximation. And we have few analytical traditions. In particular, for uh, we have value of the correlator for the long time behavior depicted as the two dots, which say that the value of the correlator is one over Q square, where time is measured in the uh, integers value of Q. There are even numbers. So Q takes value two, four, six, and so on and so forth. So we can see that at those particular points, the, the value of the correlator is quite quite simple. And this is uh, quite surprising. Uh, what, what is the value? We have also uh, obtained short time behavior at the very beginning of the dynamics. And this short time behavior allows us to estimate critical time at which the bell correlation appears in the system. So we see that for the given number of particles, the, large, the larger number of particles, the faster bell correlation uh, mm -hmm. are created. And now is the question, because this was one tumor of approximation, so this is still on the level of the pen and paper, this is purely as the j square operator, but there's the question if we can have this result in the real experimental scenario in the optical lattice. So our position from 2020 with, uh, in the collaboration with Emilia uh, and Alice Sinatra was to consider two components was a Hubbard model in one dimensional optical lattice. So what we have, we have two, two particles, okay. blue and pink, and they interact among each other and also uh, between each other uh, in different species. We have coping from side to side and two uh, amplitudes of interaction. And in the momentum representation of, the, of this model, in the low temperature, when the system is in the superfluid phase, we can show that the effective Hamiltonian is exactly as that square in the lowest possible uh, moment. So it means that we should expect that those kind of correlations we have shown before are able to, uh, can be generated in such experiment. And this is the main result of this work. When we compare dynamics given by two body, the two component Boza, uh, Hubbard Hamiltonian with two mode prediction. And we can see that the black line, which is the full man body numerics, is in the really good agreement with the two mode approximation, which is given by, by the dots, and with quite good approximation for the analytics given by this, this uh, dashed green, uh, blue line. And what we can this read, thing. yes. Full man body dynamics, do you take into account higher bar? No, no. The, the of course, the Havari is the lowest possible scenario, but we do not put any constraint about uh, maximum number of bosons per lattice mm -hmm. and so on. So, this is like, with the okay, heavy numerics. I mean, I don't want to talk about these details, but this is without any additional assumption, despite being in the lowest the bound level of the model. This is 1D, yes? Yeah, this is 1D. Uh, so what we can read from, from this figure, so we can put the uh, horizontal lines with, which distinguish between different kinds of correlations which appear in the system. And for example, you can see that for times from, let's say, pi half to pi half plus epsilon, in this time, we have uh, three bell correlated particles. For this period of time, we have four bell correlated particles. And finally, at pi half, we have all particles bell correlated in terms, of our, uh, in terms of our correlator. So it means that indeed we have preparing the lab experimental protocol generating many bodies in single state. And uh, there was the question if you can prepare similar story for other uh, experimental protocols. And one of the questions in the field was if we can make the same uh, 
the same squeezing dynamics for the fermions. With the fermions, the story is very different because bosons they interact by collision. And in all those systems, we have unit shielding, so we have ideally one particle per lattice size. With the fermions, when we have one particle per lattice size, n particles in total, there is no interaction between fermions. So it means that there should be no squeezing, no, no, no linearity. And the big question was how to introduce to the system the interactions. And we came up with the idea that we can have external laser field, which is position dependent in phase. And long story short, effectively, we can show that this Hamiltonian, which is the Fermi Hubbard in the multi insulating phase strong repulsion, plus position dependent phases, reduce the, the effective description to the sigma z squared. Moreover, when we add additional laser field, we can generate time. <laughs> and the big thing now is that this is very fast proposal, experimentally feasible to generate the time dynamics. Because so far people knew the fact, but there was no experimental proposal for them. And that's why this is uh, quite important because with this proposal, you can increase accuracy of the optical lattice plots, which are based on fragments in the optical lattice. <laughs> and our last paper, which also showed how to generate such a state, is the combination of. So, so yes. you can comment how you, because uh, I guess this splitting is in bosonic system, no. right? So in the, in the, like the, you mean, I mean, like when you write this effective Hamiltonian, so you have sigma z and in bosonic orients, uh, you have some, you have your just representation of SU2 or, so, okay, yeah, yeah. or like so how you embed this space, how you uh, in, so in, the, the, in the fermionic space. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, Going from the bosonic or fermionic uh, operators, we use the swing representation for spins. Okay, so basically uh, here we have like the spins in the swing representation for yeah. fermionic operators. Does that okay. answer your question? Okay, and then you you look for the subspace of spins that are characterized by the big yes. like high angle. Okay. okay. Yeah. No question because if I have bosons, we find the boson actually. Equation is simple. And all atoms are defined the same spatial law, and then this uh, capital S S operator is just sum of the uh, power matrices for each atom individually. But then, if I have uh, already bosons in lattice of fermions, then I should really take care of the spatial division freedom. Each atom will be different spatial law. And uh, can you comment about it? I mean, take the, do you take into account this? Uh, or yes, what is the difference? So, okay, so from here to here, there's like the whole paper, and I will just make it in the nutshell. So, what we do, we we start with the, like the general second quantized Hamiltonian uh, for the for the system, both of the fermions. We impose on uh, the composition of the field operators, so this spatial behavior is there. And next, we in this case, we are able to map this model to, uh, to the spin system. Of the, okay, because we have fermions which are on different sides, they do not hope because there are strong interactions, so we can simply map it to the Heisenberg model. Okay, next in the Heisenberg model, we can show that the whole dynamics is constrained to the deep manifold which contains only the zero. Uh, spin wave momentum. And by that construction, we can show that effectively we land here. Okay. So this is like the two, two step process in the derivation. Maybe under the discussion, the source of the uh, effective interaction between parts. Here? Yes. What, what is the chi? So, ah, so chi depends on the uh, spin flip interaction in the Heidelberg model. Because we map values to the spins. So uh, chi depends on u. This is basically u square over, over j, like the tj transformation. Okay? So the, the source of the chi is in the u and j. Yeah, okay. So the source of interaction of this non is the same for both, just a collision. 
but this time the solution can take place only between atoms which are extremes. So I would say that here the interaction is due to the existence of the spin waves. That you have spin waves, which basically allows to talk to different spins of the lattice each other. So, uh, so this is not a collision at all. Okay, but in this case, why is this not a long range? And why this is because if this is interaction. So this is way, this is not long range. This is ah, okay. And then yeah. all okay. Yeah, yeah. So long story short, we have shown that it can be generated in the uh, current experiments with the kinematic optical lattice, and this is very particularly interesting for the increasing precision of the atomic numbers. This was the story for showing basically the same story. Can we simulate OAT or tag dynamics in some system? And we show that for the Einstein, uh, for the Harvard model with the long range dipole dipole interaction allows us to obtain a model which can be tuned from pure OAT to pure tag. And with that, I can just, just finish this part about this analog quantum simulators. And here I can ask the question. Can we generate such a method of the bell correlated states on the quantum computers, on, on the quantum circuit? So I'd like to go back to the first slide. And nowadays, like since the last 10 years, there's another pillar to the quantum technologies, which is given by machine learning techniques. What does it mean? It means that we can use quantum circuits, which can be quite well controlled in the system. They can depend on different parameters. They, they basically some variational answers which are inherently quantum. And we can apply machine learning algorithms allowing to solve few quite important uh, problems. For example, this kind of combination, like coupling uh, between parameterized quantum circuit with some machine learning algorithms, allow us to find the ground state of arbitrary spin Hamiltonians on the quantum circuit. So basically, we have variational answers implemented on the big quantum circuit, hopefully, and we can find that in the variational way ground state of the desired Hamiltonian. I will talk about this later. We can also use this basically workhorse for some, some, some NP hard optimization problems. Basically, we can we have family of optimization problems which are called quadratic as constrained binary optimization, which can in the language natural can be mapped on the problem to find the ground state of the pin half uh, ensemble in the problem. And the last question, uh, which is very valid nowadays, is that if we propose a quantum algorithm on the quantum circuit, we would like to optimize it. And the machine learning allows us to find the most optimal way of taking into account gate noises or on the circuit depth. And machine learning can serve us as kind of quantum components. So this was like, like the introduction, how machine learning today enters the field of the uh, quantum computing. And now let me focus uh, in a little bit more detail about uh, virtual quantum circuits. And I would like to talk about idea for the variational quantum eigensolvers. So the idea is that we prepare initial state of the product state of the qubits. Here we provide parameterized circuit with the gates, which depends on the parameters which can be controlled in the experiment. We get some output uh, state and we calculate expectation value of the uh, Hamiltonian of interest. And this is a simple variational idea. There's no rocket science in here. There's more rocket science on the level of the hardware implementation. But we want to find such a set of gates in the iterative procedure, which allows us to minimize the energy, find the best, let's say, according to others, ground state. And uh, this idea, can I, oh, okay. And this idea was published in 2014 in a book of Pascuru Uzi as the proposition to find, uh, to solve some particular pro problems in the quantum chemistry, where we have many orbitals, we have many uh, electrons and so on and so forth. And when we can map this problem to the uh, problem of spins, 
So this procedure, we can find the ground state of the given, let's say, molecule. Uh, this is another the example of how given quantum circuit, which is our answer scan, can look like. So for this particular Hamiltonian, this is simple Heisenberg Hamiltonian with some uh, spin interaction terms from side to side and some on-site potential with different amplitudes. We put on the four qubits, we propose the kind, this kind of algorithms. So we start with the product state. Next, we apply rotational operation around y axis, which depends on the uh, angle theta. Here we have second layer of local operation around z axis. We have cascade of the C mode uh, gates, which introduce kind of and not kind, they entangle neighboring qubits. And you have similar cascade here. And you can simulate this uh, this idea now on the classical computer because it's only four qubits. And you can see that starting from the randomly chosen gates, doing the optimization step, we cover, let's say, quite close to the real ground state of the of this Hamilton. So for small system, it's nothing interesting because we can solve it on the on the laptop basically. But if we consider, let's say, 40 qubits, and assume in the next decade we are able to have 40 or 50 qubits, it cannot be simulated on the computers. Easy. And the question you ask: Okay, can we generate quantum circuit, proposed quantum circuit, which generate as the many-band entangled states in the similar fashion as the OAT protocol did for us? So what we have here, we have simulation of the standard OAT procedure. And here, this is our answer for, uh, for, for many band and bandwidth state. And what we do at, the, at each time evolution of the dynamics of the OAT, we can find such a set of thetas that the fidelity between our or in target state and propose answer is maximized. And we ask the question, how to relate those looks like for this presented state. And maybe this is guided or not, but for small system, we have perfect agreement, meaning that the quantum circuit can really well reproduce the correlator which is given by the one axis between the mm. So this is only four qubits. For larger particles, it's of course more complicated. Nevertheless, we have the way to generate this on the uh, quantum hardware. And what is interesting about this? Because with this ANSAT, we have some, we can see how those many entangled states look like. We can decompose them in the uh, native gates. So this is not like something that we have in the lab. We can measure, but we do not have the structure to the many body. The composition. And the last question we can ask, okay, relax one constraint that we do not want to reproduce the one axis between dynamics, but we want to have quantum circuit with direct aims to give a value of the correlator. So we have quite similar situation, but what we minimize, we minimize uh, target uh, value of the quantum correlator we have obtained for the given set of parameters. And you can see that for the relatively not much number of optimization steps, mm -hmm. we can reach the, the value uh, of interest. But there are some questions and open problems, so it's not so, so easy. With the quantum circuits, nowadays we of course have noises in the gates. So we can have something on the family tracker in the, or even the computer, but to generate such a state in the quantum circuit with no other gates can be uh, not with the great feeder. So, for this particular uh, situation, we should always ask ourselves what is the fidelity of the quantum circuit we have found when we implement the real device? Uh, next problem is that we can find the very deep. Uh, many layers of the quantum circuit, but we want to implement it on the quantum hardware with too many gates. And we should be able to reduce the number of required gates. 
So this is the problem of quantum computers. Next thing is the barren plateau. Broadly speaking, is the rigorous proof that for deep enough quantum circuits, landscape of, of uh, for example, expectation that you're given Hamiltonians has many flat areas in the in the theta space. And all those algorithms which work, we are based on the gradient descent uh, phase because we cannot move to, to the end local minima. And this is one of the biggest obstacles for the field of applying machine learning uh, to quantum circuit problem. And at the end, this is what uh, has been asked at the beginning, measure this problem. We can generate some state, it's fine, but we can measure, we won't measure it. And quantum, standard quantum state tomography requires exponential number of measurements. The exponential number is the number of particles we have. And there are uh, new propositions which allows us to have polynomial number of measurements, which is called uh, shadow state tomography. So this is not solved problem, but there are some steps saying that, okay, there is constant effort to solve the measurement problem. And with that, basically, I uh, came almost to the end. And this is further reading if someone is interested in the details of implement protocols. And for someone who are interested in the application of machine learning to the quantum sciences, I would like to advertise our book, uh, which is uh, which is going to be uh, published by Cambridge University Press. And yeah, thank you for your attention. For the talk, just on time. It means that we have a lot of uh, time for questions. So who will start? Actually, I maybe I can start that because there was one uh, bound which was showing for this colorator, which was based on the one over two to two n, mm -hmm. which uh, then we are facing the problem mentioned by Michal that we. Oh. Uh, Many atoms, you will need a lot of measurements to to be below this small number. But as far as I understand, uh, well, I know for there are other um, there are other entanglement criteria which are not so demanding. Yes, yes. Maybe you can. Uh, how would you improve? So, let's say. Or, okay, so. Um... Basically, this was answered in, in those papers. <laughs> when mm -hmm. when you can mm -hmm. use two body correlators, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know, two body correlators in the, in the experiment to find the bound for the. Uh, you can form uh, belt inequalities based on those two body correlators measured in the lab. Mm -hmm. So, so is it easier to measure, but then you should have. Less information, yes. yes, yes. So we have we have tried to compare those predictions to our correlators, but uh, they agree on the level of uh, let's say time moments when some correlation appear during the last procedure, mm -hmm. but on this only on the uh, qualitative agreement, not on the numbers itself. Okay. Um... Okay, yes. so, then. so can you go back to the first slide where you have this uh, inequality by convention? Uh, this one, yes. So, the first comment is that I think it looks like the higher inequality, or the, there was this class introduced by Gelinski, uh, Abdehali, Kriashko, and so on. So, it's, it's very similar to, to the one that I'm talking about. And the, other, the question is what's the motivation to, to study this type of inequality? This one, yeah, motivation. Yes, why you started this one? <laughs> okay, I, I don't have. Well, no, thank you. I, I agree, yeah, of course, I agree. I think that this is a, uh, okay. So, like going deeper, this inequality, this, this correlator mm -hmm. allows us to basically we can show that its value is related exactly to one element of the density matrix you can reconstruct. So when you have the full box space uh, of the density matrix. You can show that this correlator is exactly the term in the density matrix which couples all spins up with all spins down. Mm -hmm. So, on the level of the experiment, it helped us to solve the problem because 
when we have we can reduce the problem of measuring this, we construct the quantum state in level one uh one element of the basic dimension. Well, but this is because you uh, chose particular measurements like supply yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So but can you try to optimize this inequality? I mean, like, so maybe you should choose other measurements. That's true. We, we haven't tried yet. So you just apply like, exactly those measurements to the inequality and to check the value. Mm -hmm. what, 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 so maybe I just uh, comment on this. So maybe it makes sense that once you have the correlations obtained with, from these measurements, maybe it's better to find another inequality that is better. Uh, you know, you there or this kind of thing. Yeah, of course, yeah. Any questions here? Yeah, so maybe I just put it in okay. the chat. There was a question of Professor Zhukovsky, which was answered by Professor Litton, I think. Uh, Carlo, are you here? Uh, yes. Hello. No, it was not a question, it was a little comment. Uh, and I'm pleased okay. that uh, I got the support from, uh, from the audience. This comment was supposed to be and now it will be Michal. Okay. So, no, no, but to be honest, the, the, let me just finish. Uh, uh, sorry, Michal, there is a question. No, no, there's not a question. So I would just to rephrase the statement. So I wanted to make it clear that the idea of those spin uh, squeeze states was basically implicitly uh, studied in the model of kick top developed by Fritz Hacke and his co-workers before Kitagawa and Ueda, and in particular Marek Kush wrote several papers on those we quoted. And it was confirmed in a statement by, by Professor Wittling, and I'm thankful for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Michal, please. Yeah, so I, I have two questions. One is about those optical lattices. What is, like, no systems, let's say, uh, in, uh, in this, especially in the fermionic setting, what is the flexibility of like during the interactions? Like, can you, in principle, engineer any interactions? So, so like on, okay, so on for, this, for this particular uh, scenario, what we need is the strong interactions. So, we use the first back techniques and we make the scattering the uh, large on the positive side. So the atoms repel each other. And once we are working the unit feeling, so we have exact number of atoms as the number of sides, we assume that each uh, fermion sits in the separate uh, separate uh, sides in the lattice. So here, I mean we have no full flexibility because we have to work in the strong interaction way. But in principle, it's possible can... to tune. The yes, yes, interesting. You can tune the interaction in the lattice, but we won't get this. this kind. Okay, and like, was it like this specific proposal? Was it tested experimentally? Yeah, so that, that, that's the point. That, no, because yeah. the, the paper is like published maybe a few months ago, mm -hmm. and uh, those people, I mean, they are I, okay, they already have this time we have our you know, optical lattice and so on, so forth, and we know that for them. Adding those lasers is not a big deal according to like the internal discussions. So we hope that it can be really, uh, realized. But this was in uh, 3D, yes? Yeah, but you can like uh, reduce, so you take, make, can make the one pipe in the 3D mm -hmm. lattice. And I think that this is one deal. Okay. Okay. And another question about the, the last part of this yeah. the separation of some hardware things. Did you try to compare? Uh, the say depth of this variational circuit with let's say exact or approximate compilation, uh, because you can improve like the the phase you are preparing here is to some simple, right? Yeah. You you have even in the sample, you, you just sometimes have a sigma x rotation, sometimes you have this interaction, right? But it's uh, just you consider you are talking about this power procedure simulating power. You are considering the, you want exactly. To, okay, okay. Yeah, because it, 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 it's super. It's probably, probably it's probably not so difficult to have approximate simulation of this evolution, right? And yeah, of course. I mean, this is the exact uh, simulation of the. Yeah, but I mean, like on the circuit, you can have just specific circuit that implements. Right. Uh, and yeah. 
I'm um, okay, but okay, you you can what you can make that's yeah. true is make the totalization of the evolution operator and yeah. implement this on the yeah. on, on the gate, but this all requires many two two days or two all. So it's I not it's long it's, mm -hmm. not not for me. But okay, I can say, say one thing. We are working on very similar problem, but with the restriction to the range of the interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some preliminary results, and it can be done by totalization. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yarek, please. Um, I probably mi missed it somehow. Uh, so, what is the relation between uh, spin squeezing and uh, this K party bell? Ah, okay, relation? sure, sure. Uh, yeah, okay, it was maybe not clear for me. So, the so basically, we we, we knew from the literature that the two bell bell correlation can be generated with spin squeezing. And you, we have this kind of question. We have our correlator, I mean, our, you have this uh, observable you want to measure, and you want to check what kind of state we can generate during OAT procedure. Because we knew how to generate this OAT, and we have to the question. Let's check. And it turns out that indeed this OAT procedure can generate uh, massively correlated states with a very depth uh, entanglement for oh. us. Okay, in this way. Okay, yeah. so you just took all you have your uh, your uh, inequalities, bell in, bell yeah. type inequalities, and, and you, you were, apply to all to see what kind. Yes, of we were expecting that there can be something, but uh, we have to we have we have to check in this whole. Yeah, does it does it generate like 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 well in theory infinitely uh, large co correlations, or there is some some bound? So I mean, there's the bound. I mean, there is the bound. This, uh, this one. Well, well, of course, the, the n is the bound, but, but I mean the total. No, but the other means the bound of the k and the, the length. The bound on, on the k. Is there a bound on the k? No, 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 is, no, 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 no. There is all in principle to generate arbitrary, yes, arbitrary uh, log coverage. And the uh, last question. The graphs that you were showing, these are simulations, not measurements, no? Uh, no, no. For example, here? Yes. That's, I mean, simulations. Simulations. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, what is the problem, for example, in here, in this particular result? Because this is both a Hubbard model, so we have no indistinguishable particles, that might be both. So, we can, let's say, repeat the procedure for terminal case. When we have each thermal sitting in different lattice sites, and we can now with the shadow state tomography directly measure uh, one particular, uh, like the microscope. Uh, so, okay, shadow state tomography, how it works. We want to, uh, we want to uh, reconstruct the city matrix based on the measurements. So, we have chain of thermals in our case, on randomly chosen. Uh, on randomly chosen uh, spin, we make randomly chosen rotation about x or y uh, uh, axis by pi half. And we prepare many, many snapshots for such repeated experiments. And it can be shown that with this kind of information, we can infer the city matrix with, let's say, polynomial number of measurements. And based on that, what uh, I, I explained to Remik, we can measure. We reconstruct one value of the density matrix and be very anti diagonal. And this information is the value of our correlator. Okay, thank you. So, just a comment because, like, this massive body so, correlator, like the shallow tomography is not called shallow tomography, that's just this fact, I guess. So, so, it works efficiently when you look for marginals of small size. So, when you're when the size of marginals that you're probing grows, and I guess in this case, since you have the long correlator, you're gonna, it's yeah. not gonna be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, okay, you are right. Yeah, of course, you are right. You are right. So it would be good for those things that Fischek suggested, those other criteria that are based on few body cor uh, correlator. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is not so clean. I mean, there's a lot of views under the part that I want to put right now. Yeah. Thanks again for the talk.